today, and um, we, are, we are very much looking forward to a, a presentation from Vicki Berger. Vicki's uh, expertise is in um, textiles, is that, is that was your, yeah, and, and uh, she is, she, uh, tell, us a little, tell us a little bit about your schooling, tell us about your, okay. your, your background, okay? Right. Well, when I went off to college, I wanted to be a travel writer. And so I hung out with the journalism, uh, the newspaper crew, and I took German and I took Spanish. And then as life <coughs> evolved, um, and I got married and had little ones, then I couldn't trace around the world and be a journalist. So I became a museum curator, and I specialized in clothing and textiles. And I come to this story of Guadalupe because my international friends in museums who are costume and textile curators are very interested in the garments that are worn by the various things. So that's kind of a circuitous that's way to get to this topic. That's really great. And, and uh, Vicki is a member of our congregation. You, you will frequently see her with uh, her husband Roger and um, they are one of, of our uh, bi-denominational uh, couples and and uh, Roger is a Roman Catholic by his background and Vicky is Protestant from her background but they both go to both churches and they both come on a regular they they are they are uh, amazing in their in their uh, devotion to one another and that devotion to one another that leads them to be able to attend uh, both churches and, and to fully participate in, uh, uh, in, in both. So this is a, um, also, I think, a very important essay. Yes? For those of you that don't know, Vicki was the ofrenda. Yes. Oh, yes. The, uh, the ofrenda that was the, the Mexican uh, altar that was in the front that we did all of our pictures for all saints. Uh, uh, right, and Vicky is is our mission and outreach uh, team leader for for the church, and so did that just We're turn down. out? Uh, he shut the door, so I wonder if he nudged the plug. Technology break. He's then breaking, the, flipping the circuit out on the street. Well, you know, two, days, alley. two days of rain in Phoenix and what? all the electricity was crazy. Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> like when you look back, you know, I agree with you. But now, it's like a whole bunch of snow. It's back on. Uh, oh, it's back on. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I hear. Uh, oh. Yeah. Yes, really. Where was I? Uh, my daughter this morning. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, so, the, uh, so the ofrenda uh, was a part of, of uh, what we are trying to do to welcome. It's still turning. It's still going. Uh, to, to be as welcome as, as we can to. Um, uh, a very large uh, minority of folks who are coming uh, to be part of our neighborhood. I mean, uh, 30% of, 30 to 40% of Phoenix is now um, Hispanic uh, uh, origin uh, or descent. So it's a very, uh, it's very important for our congregation to acknowledge that and to acknowledge that the future membership of this church is going to include uh, uh, People that haven't always been here, they haven't always been, here. and so uh, that we, if you if you look around on on Sunday mornings now, you'll see um, um, more uh, faces that are um, brown faces, more more Hispanic faces that are part of our congregation and part of our community. So it's really important that we have some understanding about what some of the uh, 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 traditions and some of the um, uh, richness, some of the culture that they bring uh, with them uh, uh, as they come. And this story is, uh, is what we call theologically an incarnational story. This is a story where God shows up in people. And this is a, um, one of your experiences in your life. People, every one of you has told me that, uh, that, what, that one of the most common ways that God comes to you is through, <coughs> other, through other people. And this is one of those stories um, that I, I think uh, helps. And thank you for having us do our homework. Oh. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, let's start 
with a little review of um, high school history or maybe undergraduate history to bring us up to the year of 1531. All right, 1492. Very good. Very good. Okay. Um, who came after the Columbian voyages? Two different groups of people. One yeah. after one after gold. Spanish. 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 And the other to convert the Indians? Missionary. Missionary. The missionary. missionary. Okay. Like Father Kino. Yes. Yes, indeed. Like Kino and Sarah and a whole string of, of missionaries from different orders. They were Franciscans. They were Jesuits. They were Benedictines. Um, Dominicans. Augustinians. There were, there were a lot of different orders who came to, to work with the indigenous population. Okay, 1519. 1519. Uh, oh, good student, front row. <laughs> <laughs> Cortez okay. arrived in Veracruz <laughs> with several ships and soldiers and animals, including the horses and the huge dog that the indigenous people had never seen before. And pigs. And pigs. Oh. And, you know, an assortment of things for this conquest. Um, he burns, he had this men burn some of the ships. Why? So they can't leave. Right. <laughs> Hard to have a mutiny if you can't get on your ship and sail back to Spain. Okay. So, it takes two years for Cortez and his conquistadores to conquer the Mexicas, or as they are called commonly, the Aztecs. Okay, so that was that brings us up to 1521. So here we have the beginning of the blending of these two cultures: the indigenous culture of the Mexicas and the Spanish culture. And of course, after the the conquering battles were concluded, then the Franciscan missionaries came in force. And they had a hard time because there was already set up in the Mexica culture a hierarchy of gods and a rich culture. And so here we're getting this clash between the message that the Franciscans are bringing and the culture that is already there. Okay, so 1521, we're going to skip ahead to 1531, just 10 years after the, the official end of, of the conquest. Okay, now let's put aside that little historical intro and talk a little bit about where this action is going to take place. Um, have any of you ever been to what is now called Mexico City? Oh, yes, lots of hands, lots of hands. Okay. Mexico City was called Tenochtitlan, and it was the capital city of the Mexicas, the Aztecs. And so that is where this, this action takes place. Um, so first, let's take a look at Mexico City today. Okay. And then we're going to have participants read the story of the action that happened in what is now Mexico City in 1531. <coughs> All right, this is a shot taken at the floating garden <coughs> of Xochimilco. Who has been to Xochimilco? Good. That's how long ago? Um, in the 80s. In the 80s? <laughs> okay. I, well, I, I can beat that. In, in backwards time, I was first there in the 60s um, because I was a student in Mexico City and lived with a Mexican family and rode the bus every day to Toluca to go to what was then called Mexico City College. But I went back, when I got started on this quest to really learn more about Guadalupe, I went back for a spring break by myself, and, and I did all the things that tourists do, but underlying all of that was a preparation to spend a full day at the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe. So, this is a shot taken at the floating gardens of Xochimilco. Early on a Sunday morning, before all the tourists arrived, and the, pleasant, the pleasantness of the day is that you choose a boat 
either with <laughs> your own group or with a group of new friends. And you cruise, you just float through the canal of, of the garden of Xochimilco. And I like this barge because it says Xochimilco, so we know where we are. <laughs> and as we cruise through, now remember, this is my warm-up. This is what I did the whole week. I went to all of these things that you read about in the travel book. Um, here was this wonderful shrine along one of the canals. And it has two characters that we're going to, to read about. It has the Mexica Aztec man, uh, Juan Diego, and the lovely lady that's a little bit hidden by all of the beautiful decorations who we will learn uh, about Guadalupe. I spent another day. No, we're okay. 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 I spent another day at, at the premiere museum in Mexico City, and I think in Mexico, um, the National Museum of Anthropology. Been there. Been there. <laughs> <laughs> Been there. Okay, good. Well, it, it was the architect for the National Museum of, of Anthropology, the same architect who, who also designed the new Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe. He's a well-known well architect. And of course, I was looking for her. And I found her. I found her both in the first floor and on the second floor. And you can spend a half a day on the first floor when we have our field trip. We get a half a day for the first floor. And then we have lunch at the wonderful uh, restaurant. And then the afternoon for the second floor. But here she is. And let's see. Where is my little... Do I have a the remote? The little remote? It's behind it. Behind the laptop? Oh, there. You play with it and see if you can find out where the remote thing is. This is brand new technology, folks. This is the first time it's ever been plugged in and used. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, but here yeah. she is. Until we find the pointer feature, here she is on this um, this little home oh, altar. <laughs> you see one that says pointer? Pointer. Oh, what's the one? Hey, one? she found it. Which one is on the right? I did computer and, uh, uh, and then I did pointer. Okay. I'm not going to say that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, represents, she represents one of the indigenous groups in Mexico. The whole second floor of the museum takes you from group to group, gives you a map of where this uh, indigenous group lives, and then tells you about their culture. Was it all from there? Yeah. I found her on banners. Oh. <laughs> I found her on banners. Um, a little <coughs> chapel, and then beside the chapel, a banner with a painted image of Guadalupe. Mm. Now, this this is a type of yarn craft that's practiced by the Huicho Indians. And we're probably very familiar with the God's eyes, but look, next to them is this shield and I know it's hard to recognize, but on the right side of the shield, you will see a very stylized Guadalupe. I almost missed her. Yeah. See? Mm -hmm. But you can see the halo around her. Mm -hmm. And in the case adjacent to that, there was beautiful ceramics, um, primarily um, to hold incense, which is not a part of our tradition, but it is very much a part of indigenous tradition and Roman Catholic tradition. So most of these are censers, but above the ceramic was a beautiful red, white, and green flag with an embroidered um, image of Guadalupe. And the, the words at the top say, Reina, which is queen, the queen of Mexico. Now, the next day, I went to the um, area of Tula, which is a short drive straight north from Mexico City. This was the capital of the Toltec civilization. And I always studied about these um, columns <coughs> in school, and I wanted to see them, and I accomplished that. But coming home, I had two spottings of Guadalupe. first one was at a restaurant. 
and there was a little shrine, and it was way up at the ceiling. So you have to have a ladder to light the candles and to water the poor little flowers, which nobody had done. <laughs> um, but there she was, and that is a photograph of the actual image of what we say. And then coming back home, we stopped to visit a church, which happened to be closed, but across the street there was a landscape company. And look at all the water we Wow. We've got several sizes here. We have a really large statue mm -hmm. here, here, and we have the Buddha over here. Fantastic. And we have lions and columns and so forth. Um, so just as we see these statues in the yard here in Phoenix, you can turn over. Yeah. Oh, lovely. wow. Okay, another day trip. Let's see Puebla. Puebla, which is east and then maybe a little bit south of Mexico City. And we're stopped at a traffic light. And I look over at the church. And Puebla, by the way, is famous for Talavera pottery. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there are four there are four mosaics. So I roll the window down and sure enough, those four mosaics explain the story of Guadalupe. <coughs> what exquisite work. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely wow. stunning. Wow. Those are tiles. Those are tiles. Yeah, if you go to places like the Mexican stone and tiles, um, retail store here mm -hmm. in Phoenix. You can you can order those. You can order in any size shape. Okay, so still in Puebla, at the church, the main church, there is a very elaborate side altar in the church to Guadalupe. It was one of the prettiest sets that we saw. So when, when we take our field trip, we'll do more. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. According to tradition, now let's 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 learn something about the story. Um, the story takes place in the winter. It takes place in December, December 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th in the year 1531. Now those dates are adjusted dates because Pope Gregory adjusted the Julian calendar to become the calendar, the Gregorian calendar that we use today. Is that right, Steve? Right. Is that right? Okay. So, um, it didn't actually happen on the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, but that's the calendar that we use today. But it was December. And in Tenochtitlan, Mexico City, it's a high altitude and it's cold. And it's cold. So, it's winter and it's cold. And that's important because flowers become a part of this tradition. <coughs> I'm going to introduce the four main characters and then some of you are going to read the story to us. The first character is Juan Diego. Juan Diego. Um, Juan Diego was an indigenous person. Uh, some sources say he worked as a laborer, that he was one of many men <coughs> who carried burdens on his back, supported by a band you know, that went around his forehead and supported the burden that he that he would carry. Um, he had been converted by the Franciscan missionary. And he had be, been given the Spanish name Juan Diego. This is a plaque with a presumed image, a stylized image of what Juan Diego would have might have looked like. And this is at the Basilica of Our Lady um, on the inside of the basilica, here's another image of Juan Diego telling us a little bit about the story. And there he is listening because he's going to hear some birds <coughs> and that one little detail of the story. Like mm. A young lady, oh, by the way, the language of the Mexicas was Nahuatl. That's important in the story, too. A young lady, um, a lovely young lady, brown skin, who spoke the Aztec language. She will speak to Juan Diego in the Aztec language. 
So Juan Diego is an indigenous person who works as a laborer, and this woman who, young woman who visits him speaks to him in his own language. And we see numerous images um, throughout the whole, the gardens of the basilica, which are absolutely stunning. So there she is again. Okay, third character, the bishop-elect. Franciscan is named, all these guys are named Juan. <laughs> we have Juan Diego, now we have bishop, or bishop-elect, Juan Zumarraga. Juan Zumarraga. He will play an important part in the story. And another statue of him. Oh, we need. We will spend on our field trip a half a day just enjoying the gardens and all the sculpture. Oh, oh, that took us all the way to the end. Um, we may need Shauna to come and bail us out. Try the back arrow. Try the back arrow. No, nope. we are we are definitely going backwards. But we're getting a preview. <laughs> Walmart. Just close your eyes. Oh, yeah. <laughs>
and suggested that the lady send one of the high nobles to deliver her request, rather than an ordinary commoner such as he. She again instructed him to bishop, visit the bishop. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the first part of the story. I think Kathy has the next two days. Wasn't a whole lot going on, but the action moved forward a little bit. Sunday, December 10th, 1531, and Monday, December 11th, 1531. The next day, Juan attended Sunday Mass and then obediently went back to the palace. Again, he told the story to Zumaraga. Still not convinced, Zumaraga asked for a sign or proof to confirm the story. Juan devoted Monday to caring for his dying uncle, Juan Bernardino. Okay. So, so this is, we're three days into the story. So Juan Diego has been to see the bishop, and he's seen the lady a couple of times. His uncle is not well, and it's just been a bad week. <laughs> <laughs> so the next day, the 12th, is then the finale of the story. Okay? Tuesday, December 12th, 1531. Very early on Tuesday, Juan Diego left his home to summon a friar for his uncle's last confession. Intent on his family, family mission, uh, Juan Diego tried to avoid the lady, but she intercepted him and assured him that his uncle would not die. Somewhat comforted, Juan Diego relayed the bishop's request for proof of her appearance. She directed Juan to climb the hill, pick flowers, and bring them to her. To his amazement, he found flowers blooming in spite of the winter weather. He put them in his tilmuk at the cloak or cave and returned to the lady. She took the flowers in her arms, returned them to Juan's tilma, and, let, and sent him off to see the bishop. Juan tells the story to Zumaraga for the third time. In the dramatic ending, Juan opens his tilma, the flowers tumble to the floor, and the miraculous image of the, of the lady is seen on the tilma and the bishop falls to his knees in awe and devotion to the Virgin. He accepts the image as a sign he has requested, and he immediately orders the chapel to be built. Meanwhile, the lady had visited San, uh, Juan Diego's uncle, Juan Bernardino, cured him of his illness, and instructed him to, be, to give her image the name Consummate Virgin, St. Mary of Guadalupe. <coughs> Okay. Now, the word that she used, remember she's speaking Nahuatl to Juan and Juan, was not Guadalupe. <coughs> but when the Spaniards heard this nine-syllable word in, in, the, um, in Nahuatl, it sounded to them like Guadalupe. And there was already a Madonna of Guadalupe in Spain. As a matter of fact, a lot of the conquistadores came from this area of Spain, and they already knew about Guadalupe. So they made the connection. Oh, she has appeared again in the New World, and it's Guadalupe. And she looks different <coughs> from our Guadalupe back in Spain, but that was a connection that the Spaniards made coming from this very complicated nine-syllable word to Guadalupe. All right, so here is an image of statues in the gardens of the Basilica that shows the dramatic moment when Juan Diego unfurls his tilma, and there is the image of the Lady of Guadalupe. and another set of statues in the garden. This is why roses, now some of the early accounts don't say Castilian roses, but they say flowers, and, and they name a lot of flowers indigenous to central Mexico. But again, with the Spaniards and bringing their culture to the New World, it has morphed into being Castilian roses. Mm -hmm. So that's why, with her image, you usually see roses. So now let's take a visit to the uh, Basilica of Guadalupe. And there are two, the older one on our right, 
And then the newer one, which was finished in 1976, is in the middle of the picture. It is an absolutely stunning well, church. Is it much, as much larger as, as it looks? The it is huge. Yes. It is just overwhelmingly huge. And well, so it's like a super dope. Yeah, yeah. Well, wait, wait to see the inside. Um, now, Monday was December the 12th, so it was the feast day of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And there would have been maybe millions, more than a million people here in this plaza for the grand celebration of Guadalupe. So we're getting closer. And here is a shot of the inside. It is, it is absolutely breathtaking. Absolutely breathtaking. Now, I want to point out the framed tilma. According to tradition, this is, right here, the framed tilma that Juan Diego wore that has the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. It is behind bulletproof glass. It is framed in silver and gold, and it is displayed behind the altar, and there is a space between the chairs that you see that are upholstered in red and the wall where the tilma is displayed. And this is a clever way that you can get up close to the tilma. Below and behind the altar, even while a church service is going on, visitors can get closer to the image. And look look how everybody, look at the angle. Everybody is looking up. Mm -hmm. And there are one, two, three, there are four moving walkways just like we have out at Sky Harbor. And one of them goes this way, and then the next one goes this way, and this way, and this way. So, I mean, I must have been down here for 45 minutes just riding the walkway <laughs> and taking hundreds of pictures without any interference. This is really as close as we can get to this image. Now, I did read in the paper and heard on NPR that <coughs> when Secretary of State Hillary Clinton visited Mexico City, they actually, the church actually lowered the image in its frame so that she could see it. Wow. That. <coughs> so, if we were on the walkway, this is what we would see. Okay, I have to read this. Was the walkway there when you visited? Yes. Yeah. 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 Steven, the walkway was there? I did not go to this. Okay. We'll go next time. <laughs> I'd love to. Okay. So, so let, let's take a look at a photograph of the image. Um, this is one that I purchased in the gift shop there at the Basilica. And believe me, that's not gold and silver. <laughs> I had it framed in a gold tone and a silver tone to, to reflect the, how the actual image is, is framed. Okay. So that is almost a complete image. The framing took apart a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. um, this, there's a stain over on this right hand top corner and according <coughs> to the literature uh, that the church provides, that happened when um, conservators or maybe um, non-conservators were cleaning the frame and they spilled some kind of ashes or cleaning material on the fabric. And so that's what that stain is. So, um, yeah, big oops. <laughs> yeah, big oops. Big oops. Um, the reproductions of the image all carry these messages in the corner saying that this is an official copy of the original Tilma. All right, so here is a good close up of her. Um, a young woman. Very modest, I think. Um, very kind countenance. Her hands in an attitude of prayer. Um, she is wearing 
wearing a white undergarment. You can just see a little bit here. And then she's wearing a pink gown and this beautiful blue mantle. So is that more in the tradition of, of the indigenous people or, spa or, or Spanish? I think this is, and Steve, you can chime in here, pink and blue throughout art history seem to be Mary's right. official colors. Mm -hmm. You will see her in Italian art, when you study Italian art history and you know, anywhere, that usually she is in pink gown with a blue mantle. So this is Western European yes. tradition. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the blend of the young lady with the dark skin speaking Nahuatl and the traditions that the Spaniards would be familiar with in the old world. Is there like, a tear in the, one of her eyes? Oh, there's recently, well, not so recently, over many decades, there have been um, scientific examinations of her with various kinds of technology. And some of the citations in the literature talk about the fact that when her eyes are enlarged 2,500 times, that the scientists can see figures of people in her eyes. So, all kinds of stories. The gold border, the gold stars, and the gold motifs on the pink gown were added later. Had it dress her up more. That's right. One thing that the sources say relates to her background as a Mexica young woman is this black sash, which in the Aztec custom was worn by women when they were pregnant. So that's an inference. For us. Mm -hmm. Now, I just want to point out this bulge underneath her gown. That is her knee. She's wearing a long gown and that is her knee. And so it gives her a physical attitude of walking. And she is seen by the people. Now Roger and I have been in Mexico, we've been in Guatemala, and we've been in Honduras. The indigenous people see her as one who is interested enough in them that she will she will walk to where they are. She is in the churches. She is in the homes, on the home altars. That she kind of like our Secretary of State. She gets assigned to go to Mexico. She gets assigned to go to Honduras. She gets assigned to go to Guatemala. You know, she's everywhere. And people mention that. Um, she's surrounded by a halo. And where we might be more used to seeing a halo that surrounds the head, this is a halo or an aura that surrounds her whole body. Are you going to talk about her hair? Um, dark hair parted in the middle, yeah, primarily blue. hidden by her. Loose, loose versus braided. How do they know that? Yes. Um, I think because of the way you can see what would, where it's I have bangs, we'll get to another full shot of her. Okay. Loose meant un, un, unmarried. Right. Braided hair meant married. Right. Right. Um, speculation is that the crescent moon and the little little angel underneath who is supporting her were added later. And there's the angel. I think she looks very Francisca. <laughs> 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 hairdo and all. And his wings are green, white, and red, which become the colors of the Mexican flag. All right, so there she is. And you were asking about her hair, Mike. She's the center part and smooth down like this. Braided would probably be to the back. Yeah. Well, and at the very end, I have a picture of an Aztec woman. Okay. So we can see the difference. All right, our daily life. Now, when I came last month and gave you the assignment to look for her, if you have seen her, either one of these or something else, then I want you to chime in. All right, um, this is St. Mary's in downtown Phoenix, mm -hmm. and this is my husband's home parish. And beside it, there is a beautiful plaza with fountains, and against the wall of the parking deck, there is a wonderful sculpture that has Juan Diego, Our Lady, 
and the most magnificent prickly pear cactus. <laughs> Juan Diego is almost always accompanied by a huge prickly pear cactus. And we have plenty of those, don't we? Mm -hmm. um, December the 12th is the feast day of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and this was from a previous um, feast day with, and here are the roses, here are the mariachis for the celebration, and here is a young woman who is wearing a, a homemade costume and portraying the part of Guadalupe. And just go a little bit south, kind of south of Ikea. And you will find the, the complex that is called Guadalupe. Um, it was founded in, I think, 1904. And the um, indigenous people who were fleeing Mexico during the, um, the dictatorship <coughs> of Porfirio Diaz settled and founded Guadalupe. And so it's a wonderful experience to go there. Just go for lunch. Go for lunch. Very small place, right? Yes, like just one mile. One mile, one mile square. square. Yeah. Tiny little place. Yeah. Eight, eight years before our stay place. Mm -hmm. yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah. still yeah. And guarded by our sheriff. Okay, and the church, uh, the parish church there is Our Lady of Guadalupe. So I take Roger on all kinds of adventures, including we have to go to Mass. In Guadalupe. <laughs> so I can take some good pictures. So, but here she is as a mosaic. But I, uh, I explained yeah. the Yaki children mm -hmm. for adoption of a sibling group of ten, and um, oh the the Yaki social services were right there <laughs> in, in Guadalupe. Mm -hmm. It was really really interesting as they. Um, stepped in and participated about which family the children would go to. Oh. And um, they, they picked a Caucasian family, but their sons were married to um, Mexican women. It's a blended family. A blended family, yeah, and they decided it was easier to teach the children their culture mm -hmm. than to look for a Yaki family that would take ten children. children. Okay, hmm. next to the church. There is another building that's called the Tempo. Um, it's a very plainly ornamented building with a dirt floor. It is still used. And the weekend that we were there, um, all of the statues from procession were stored here at, at the back of the Tempo. And the statue, of course, that caught my eye was Guadalupe. And here she is, a homemade costume. And now they, I don't think they have it now on their <coughs> website, but the town of Guadalupe has a website, and for a while they had a YouTube image of the procession showing the prisoners carrying the statue of Guadalupe in the December 12th procession. All right, been to Bisbee lately? Okay. okay, if you look closely, about five miles out of Bisbee, there's this wonderful shrine. Of course, oh, yeah. we stopped and to, to look inside, and there she was. Um, many times in outdoor sculptures, yard sculptures, and so forth, you will find rosaries draped around her neck. This, I've been to the church, and I can't remember, south of Tucson there. Sanavir? Yeah. Okay. I think it is. Yes. Yeah. Why is that with the desert? Is any of that modeled after this? Um, I, you know, I haven't been to Sanavir in two or three years. I haven't been there either. I can't remember yeah. whether. But the next trip, let's see if we I see. Assume, <coughs> I assume they have one. It's beautifully there. decorated yeah. and recently uh, conserved. Sure. Yeah. The mm -hmm. past two or three times I've been there, you couldn't see a whole lot because of the scaffolding. Yes. So I don't remember. Yeah. That's quite a nice trip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. This showed up. These are return address labels. I know this. <laughs> yeah. They showed up in my mailbox while I was working on this project. <laughs> the good sister is at somewhere in Texas wanted a donation. Yeah. But, you know, you get the little gift. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. an there she is. <laughs> yeah. All right. This is my friend Robert Bitto. Um, if you ever shop for Mexican imported things, you know, decorative items, jewelry, and whatnot, 
You may have been to a shop. It used to be on 7th Avenue, then it was on 7th Street. Um, Robert now just does work uh, over the internet. But we've been friends now for eight years, and he allowed me to come into his store and photograph all of the Guadalupe art and craft that he carried in the store at this time. I mean, everything from <coughs> a little wall hanging, a, a sequined applique for the back of your jean jacket, mm -hmm. um, to a switch plate cover. <laughs> Our doorbell. Here's the doorbell. I love this. <laughs> There's the doorbell. <laughs> 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 By the way, there are, there are some little calendars on the table that have uh, Guadalupe on the front and a 2012 calendar on the back. So uh, those were a gift from my friends at um, Dulceria Pico Rico for us. So what else does Robert have? Mouse pads for your computer. There's the, the switch. <laughs> these are magnets. And, and look at these uh, icons of Mexican <coughs> culture. Here's Guadalupe. Who's this? Can you see her? Oh, that's Frida. Frida Kahlo. And this guy with the mask? Lucha Libre Fighter. Yes, yes. D1, you're going to see the other. Uh, Christmas ornaments. These ornaments are actually made in Poland. <laughs> so what I, the, the concept here is that Guadalupe is an international phenomenon, right. truly, truly. I bet they even make some of those in China. Oh, I'm sure there are. <laughs> the resin statues at Walmart were were made in in, in China. But here's Guadalupe, and here's Frida, and then that is a candle holder, and there's another ornament. T-shirt, of course. Of course. Yeah. Tote bags. Tote bags with sequins. <laughs> <laughs> to come off. Yeah, eventually. And this is another really good friend, Marguerite Tram. She owns the um, Purple Lizard Boutique, which, uh, give a plug here, is at the corner of Thomas and that would be 15th, I think, yeah. across the street exactly. from Phoenix College. And some of you know that I've been hanging out at Phoenix College for the past five or six years. <coughs> um, and Marguerite, too, uh, brings in a lot of things that have a um, Mexican theme, indigenous theme, including fiber optic statues. <laughs> <laughs> Um, magnet, mm -hmm. note cards, shadow boxes, oh, painted tin is a very popular Mexican craft. Mm -hmm. And uh, you will see it in all manner, shapes, and forms. <coughs> T-shirts, baby bibs, <laughs> tote bags and medallions. Fabric tote bag. Here's look at this. Here's Juan Diego with his tilma and his signature prickly pear cactus. Mm -hmm. And those were made of pre-printed fabric. If you hang out at fabric stores, there are even today people who sew, and and you can buy yardage <laughs> that is stamped with shapes which right. you cut out and you stuff to make a pillow or or something rather. That was made from pre-printed uh, fabric that you cut up and stitch together for your tote bag. Go to Walmart. <laughs> yeah. Votive candle. Well, and I just thought it was a Safeway. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, well you can take right. Sure. Yeah, 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 everywhere. The everywhere. Yeah. Store. Um, internationally, the, the incense was made in Thailand. Which, super, which uh, Walmart was the not sure after? The one at Chris Town. Okay. I mean, there's a new supermercado Walmart um, over on the west side, but I haven't gotten over there to visit. I, I go to uh, Ranch Market. Um, music with the traditional songs um, that are sung. We sang them Monday night at church. All right, this is a good one. Also at Christtown, there is a company called Hometown Threads, and they have all kinds of things to wear, but they also have Afghans. And... 
here is Guadalupe on an afghan, and the afghan was woven in North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, Ace Hardware, not to be left out. <laughs> Absolutely stunning, vivid greeting cards with Guadalupe. All right, so take a trip down to Tucson. You have to stop here. It's about the only place you can stop on the way down. <laughs> and so com coming out of the ladies' restroom right there in the corridor was a velvet painting mm. of Guadalupe. Yes. Oh, wow. Yes. And why didn't I buy that? <laughs> Did you buy the Elvis that was in front of the man? <laughs> Maybe I was distracted by Elvis. <laughs> now, this is a little trip to San Antonio, um, but we went for a weekend costume society get-together, and I purchased this little image at um, the art museum, um, Mercado, and this was out on an outdoor um, like a little marketplace, and this was larger than life. I mean, that, that was a huge canvas that was for sale there at the market. All right, now, back to Phoenix. This is the corner of Roosevelt and 7th Ave. Yes, El Norteño. Good food. Primarily takeout. Mm -hmm. um, and on the south side of the building is this wonderful wall mural of Guadalupe, and I want you to notice what happened to our little Franciscan angel. He's now a little... Oh, <laughs> 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 now, they have been adding to the mural. I didn't get a chance to go over and photograph the new section, but over here, someone has been working. We saw someone painting, so I'll have to go check that Look out. Look at the, at the top. It says... God bless this business. That's right. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Just, that's great. Yeah. Oh, I have a, a in in uh, where where I used to live on Northern, and, and Michael lived after that. I had bought uh, a, at the local tile store. Mm -hmm. I got a Guadalupe, and it was the only one they had. And so um, I, she was. Put up on the wall that faced the door as you as you went out in the morning. So the first thing you saw was a fountain next to She was really lovely, really lovely. But she had this, she had a surprised look. And, you know, it's like it was like, and and I I brought a priest friend over to look, and he said, he said, well of course she's surprised. She's in a Protestant minister's garden. <laughs> Is that she woke up and I brought her to the middle of the day. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, that's little wonderful. Little that's so and the candle was there. I did not stage the candle. It was there. All right, and speaking of, that. is she yeah. like that? Okay. Yeah. This is in uh, the garden of a friend of ours here in Phoenix. And this is the kind of thing that you can buy at Phoenix Stone and Tile. And she's right. Her expression depends on the mood that the painter was in that day. <laughs> <thing. laughs> <laughs> Painting the tile. He knows where she's going. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but this is the best. Okay, Roger and I hang out at the um, downtown YMCA. That's where we work out. And while I was working on this project, I read that she was a favorite object of tattoo art. I thought, well, I could go to a tattoo parlor and I could interview somebody, but better yet, if I can find somebody who here at the Y who works out and would let me take a picture, then that would really be a great part of this talk. So I started going around to the guys at the gym saying, oh, man, I love your tat. <laughs> Do you know anybody who has a tattoo of Guadalupe? No, no, no. A couple of weeks of this went by and finally one of the guys said, oh, yeah, Brock just got a new tattoo of Guadalupe and, and I'll get you in contact with him. And, and it worked. This is Brock Gallus, who was an ASU student at the downtown campus, right, you know, across the street from, from the Y. And Brock had several tattoos. He is of Hispanic origin. 
but didn't really know the story of Guadalupe. He just wanted to make points with his grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> and so he got a tattoo of Guadalupe, and he was bold enough and kind enough to let me take this wonderful picture of his tattoo. Mm. Second skin. Yeah. Now, cool. one of the things that we ran across during this project was the fact that an ASU professor wrote an opera telling the story of Guadalupe. And, of course, there are CDs to right. go along with the opera. <coughs> All right. So, to finish up, we were wondering about Aztec hairstyles. <coughs> there is the Aztec hairstyle with the protuberances <coughs> up at the top. So here is an Aztec woman. And here is Our Lady of Guadalupe, the Madonna of Guadalupe of Spain. And in the middle is an image of Our Lady of Guadalupe on Juan Diego. So, in the intervening months, have any of you seen any images of Guadalupe as you've been tootling around town? I was at uh, Glendale Glitter <coughs> the first mm -hmm. night it opened and they had all this horrible, horrible plastic jewelry. But there was there was a necklace with a thing about that big. Mm -hmm. with kind of a stylized... A medallion? A medallion. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Did you buy it? No. No. You could have worn it today. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen them on Christmas cards. Christmas cards, yeah. yeah. Christmas mm -hmm. cards. Building. Last week's food for the ad had this in it. <coughs> it's written in English and in Spanish. We have all the products to celebrate Our Lady of Guadalupe, and it's got some of the picture products on there that were available at that store. Oh, that's wonderful. Good. Can I Xerox that? Yeah. I can have it. Good. I'll scan it. Okay. Um, Kathy saw her a couple of times? Um, mural. A mural on 16th Street. I can't remember exactly where I was, but. Okay. I have to let Kitty out. Okay. All right. Anybody else see her this month? She, she was uh, a picture block. Um, at Picture Rock Retreat Center, there is a uh, an outdoor statue of of her that you see right in front of the chapel. And as you look, uh, she is she is uh, there's a, a shelter over her. And as you look, you see the whole city of Tucson. Uh, oh it's a, it's a, it's a, you know through her behind her. Mm -hmm. Really, it's really very lovely. Okay. Well, Roger and I did go to the uh, celebration on Monday night. And there were roses. There was the telling of the story. There is a gentleman in the parish who always plays the part of Juan Diego. And he has a tilma. And the roses are wrapped up in it. And as the story is being told, just like you read it to us today, he spreads out his arms and the tilma unfolds and the roses fall to the floor. It's, it's very wonderful. Then there's big party with Mexican food and mariachis, and it was a great evening. So, so I hope this will help you understand part of the culture that we encounter in our everyday lives living here in the Southwest. Thank you so much. But even in, in North Carolina, the first time we had a Day of the Dead celebration, we had 90 people. The next year, we had over 600. Oh, wow. So, Anglos and Hispanics alike come together to learn more about each other's cultures, which I think is great. Yeah. 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 Steve helped with this project. And so from our friends at Pico Rico, here's a little 2012 calendar. Thanks. And um, does anyone have a birthday this month? An anniversary? Yeah. Birthday? This is um, pumpkin seed riddle from Pico Rico. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have a birthday or celebration? All right, then we'll put these up on the table and we'll open them up and you can try seed, mixed seed riddle and sesame seed riddle. These are very typical Mexican foods. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. This is just great, and what a, what a, what a wonderful opportunity to 
there to do something uh, a little bit different. And remember, without without Mary, Christmas doesn't happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and, and without Mary, Christmas doesn't happen. And Mary has a very prominent place in all Christianity. And this vision of Mary, you can read about in the book of Revelation in chapter 12, where she is found standing among the moon and the stars and all of this, that, and that, and that she is going to be persecuted for being who she is, because she's going to be the first, Mary is the first to do what every Christian is supposed to do, which is to bear Christ into the world. That's our job, is to bear Christ into the world. And so she, Mary is known a, 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 to biblical scholars as the prototype of all Christians. Her work is our work. And the nice thing about this is that she shows up looking like us. She showed up looking like Juan Diego uh, and because Jesus is like us. Jesus is like every culture that, that depicts Mary and Jesus picture them in their own skin color, in their own uh, looking in their own way. Remember, um, frequently Jesus and Mary show up. We have a we have a little one that's here in the in, in the storeroom at the moment where Mary and Jesus are blonde, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which is not very likely. <laughs> I, might, I, 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 I might add, and so this is, this is an amazing thing, and thank you for sharing uh, with us this cross-cultural Mary, uh, European and, and Native, yeah. The one thing I think is so great is that when she was given her, her assignment for Jesus, she never questioned that she could do it. Right. She, it was, she assumed she could. She just said, and she says, let it be. Let it be. Mm -hmm. Let it be. So that's great. Well, thank you, Vicki. Thank and, and we all uh, thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Um, we'll have a word of grace, and then we will eat. Okay. Thank you, God, for our time together, and thank you for this um, wonderful occasion of Christmas and the birth of Jesus. Thank you for Mary's role in this and her continuing role as the mother of the Americas in this wonderful Our Lady of Guadalupe. We ask that you would uh, bless us and bless the things that we've learned today, strengthen us through the food that we eat, that we might serve you by serving others. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.